This is the Living History Podcast, broadcasting live across the airwaves. Hello everyone, welcome to Living History and to an interview that I've been looking forward to bringing you for a very long time. Today we're speaking to James Holland, who is a historian that many of you will know. He's written some absolutely fabulous history books over the years. He appears quite regularly in British documentaries about the world wars, and he's just a really great bloke all around. He, follow him on his Twitter feed, follow him on social media, because he's really a brilliant historian who's got lots of wonderful things to say, and his focus specifically is on World War II. He's done a lot of great work in that space, exploring World War II and its implications. And today, that's what we're going to be talking to him about. We're going to be talking specifically about the North Africa campaign, which I know that a lot of you out there are very interested in, particularly if you had family members who served at Tobruk or Alamein or Badia or one of these other famous actions from North Africa. North Africa probably gets a little bit overshadowed by what went on later in the war in Europe and definitely in Australia by what happened in the Pacific. But it's still a really important part of that World War II story, and we should know more about it than we do. So it's really exciting to talk to James. So James, thanks for joining us, and welcome to Living History. Ah, oh, well, thanks for having me on, Matt. And um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I feel honoured. The guy, he's kind of sort of, you know, TV historian and historian in his own right and master of battlefield tours. I mean, you know, you're a pro as well. Well, thank you. I think you're. I think you're far too kind, but I'll certainly take that compliment on board. Um, why don't we begin? Why don't we begin? Tell tell us all about a little bit about yourself, because I was reading your bio just to refresh myself about all the work you've done, and the the quick summation is you've done a lot. So why don't you give us a quick summary of the uh, of of the work that you've produced? Yeah, well, I, I kind of I started off funny enough, um, you know, way back when. Um, the idea was to write a novel, sort of um, set just before the Second World War, with a backdrop of the Battle of Britain, but also um, the North Africa campaign as well. So the kind of the central kind of thrust of it takes place in the Battle of Britain, but a bit before and a bit after in the Western Desert, uh, following the kind of sort of fortunes of a lovelorn fight young fighter pilot. And I did a lot of um, research for that, and and really enjoyed it. And while I was while I was doing my research, I, I one of the guys I went to meet was a guy called Jeff Wellham. And Jeff was a Battle of Britain fighter pilot. He flew with uh, 92 Squadron. And the only reason I got in touch with him was because I fired off loads of letters via the Battle of Britain Fighter Association. And the then secretary, a guy called Mike, Malcolm Smith, then kind of passed them on to the various people. And Jeff was literally the first guy to come back to me. So he lived in Cornwall. And so I, at the time, I was living in London. And I went all the way down to Cornwall to see him. And he was absolutely amazing. He was just completely brilliant such a lovely lovely bloke anyway we met in his pub and this was in the day where you could still um you could still smoke in pubs so there he was sort of holding up my pint and he was going so here i was in my spitfire and there was this mess just met he was kind of sort of hold, waving the ashtray around it was just everything that i kind of thought an ex battle britain fighter pilot ought to be you know charming fun irreverent anecdotal you know he was just fantastic anyway cut a long story short he'd also been in malta and so he was telling me about Malta. And at the time, you know, I was completely new to this subject. I I studied um, history at university and, of course, at school as well. But I was kind of sort of, um, well, actually, 17th century was my uh, area of expertise where I did my dissertation on and all that kind of stuff. So I never really studied any Second World War. So it was all new to me. I was terribly excited about meeting all these guys. Um, and anyway, Jeff was great. And he told me about Malta. And I thought, why haven't I ever heard about really much about it? I'd heard about Faith Haven Charity, these these biplanes i'd heard about the fact that it got the george cross but basically i knew absolutely diddly squat so i went to a bookshop and i tried to um find a copy of a sort of general history about the siege of malta and there wasn't one so i said to my agent look i know i'm writing this novel and stuff but what do you think about me doing a history of the siege of malta and he'd just been to malta and he said i think that's a great idea go away and write a proposal and um we'll sort of take it from there anyway cut long story short that is what i did i got very carried away i wrote an incredibly extensive kind of book proposal and outline interviewed god knows how many people as well um and got a deal and that enabled me to give up the day job and you know retire to the country and uh start on this on this journey and you know god knows how many books and other stuff later here i am but i must tell you the thing about jeff wellham was that he told me he said actually he said about 20 years ago 25 years ago he said i was going for a really bad divorce and i was at a really rock bottom in my life 
And I started writing about a time where I'd actually done something useful in my life, the Battle of Britain. And he said, I wrote a sort of book, I wrote a sort of memoir just for myself, really. But anyway, so there's a chapter in it, which is a bit like a sort of day in the life of a Battle of Britain pilot. And you might find that interesting. I'm very happy to show that to you. So anyway, so when I got back to London, I wrote to him, dear Jeff, you know, thanks so much for the, uh, it was great to see you. You mentioned this, this chapter. I mean, any chance of seeing the whole book? And literally three days later, the one and only original hand typed manuscript of First Light turns up. And I read this manuscript and it's absolutely amazing. And at the time I was working for Penguin Books before I sort of, you know, got my big break. And, um, so I rang him up and I said, look, Jeff, you know, I didn't tell you, but I actually do work at Penguin Books. And do you want me to put it the way of the publisher? I can't, you know, an editor, I can't promise anything, but, you know, give it a go. And he went, God, Penguin's still around. I had no idea. What the hell? Anyway, they published it and it's the best selling memoir of World War II in the last 30 years or something. And it's just the most amazing story. It was just complete fluke. Uh, but if you haven't read it, Matt, you, it's just a work of genius. So um, I was, you know, he, he was a really special guy. Sadly, died in July last year, um, and a great loss. But you know, we were good friends for kind of twenty years. It was amazing, really, and um, just complete fluke that he answered my letter. So there you go. So anyway, so since then, I've been doing, I've been in books, and you know, it's like you know, you, you, one thing leads to another, and from the books has come telly and battlefield stuff, rides of the army, and all sorts of bits and pieces and weird stuff that comes from specializing in this particular subject and you know i mean you know all about walking the ground and stuff i kind of i, I just find that endlessly fascinating i have to say how do you feel I've, I've i brought this up a few times on the podcast with people that i actually you know you talk about speaking to world war ii veterans and interviewing them and hearing their stories and i i say to people that i i'm, I'm struggling with this concept that we have no world war one veterans anymore and fairly soon in a very short period of time we're going to have no world war ii veterans and for me i feel almost like a child dealing with losing their parents the fact that we're we're going to have to exist in a world that doesn't have these icons in front of us do you feel the same way yeah i do i'm feeling quite traumatized by it already i mean you know i the other day i went to the the Normandy tourism launch of what's happening at D-Day 75 on HMS Belfast, which, you know, is a sort of, you know, battle cruiser um, that served throughout the Second World War and was, you know, supporting the Canadians at Juneau and on D-Day. Anyway, it's moored up in London, as I'm sure you you know. Um, but anyway, they had this sort of party on, on there. And I thought, Christ, you know, last time I was on HMS Belfast, we had a launch party for my book on Malta, which I essentially wrote. And I invited, you know, we invited along to the launch loads of the veterans, you know, Tubby Crawford, who was the second in command of HMS Upholder, the most successful British submarine of the war. You know, we had Freddie Treves, who was on Operation Pedestal and later became a really well-known actor. We had also we had Mickey Montebello, who kind of, you know, after the war, he was a child on, on Malta and after the war emigrated to Oz and lived out his days in, in Melbourne. You know, he was just the most brilliant bloke. I, I absolutely loved him to bits. Not a single one of the people I interviewed for my multiple is still alive. And that was really, oh, that just hit me in the gullet the other day. I thought, God, you know, it really time is marching on. And of course, that makes you feel older yourself. Um, but interestingly, a friend of mine is, um, he's sort of almost too late, but he's doing this amazing work with artificial intelligence. And they're setting up avatars where you can, you interview someone. And if they do about 20 hours worth and kind of answer 250 questions, they can then speak later kind of from beyond the grave, this kind of avatar. It's really amazing technology. So he's trying to get to some of the last of the most lucid war veterans that are still around so that in kind of 15, 10, 20, you know, 20, 30 years, you'll be able to talk to this avatar and have a conversation with this person who was a Second World War veteran. And it's not, it's obviously not the same as talking to someone for real, but it is a link that we don't have with a first world war veteran for example so but yeah it's going to be terrible time isn't it i mean it's, it's just you know i mean just amazing i mean i remember so well matt going to the 50th anniversary of v-day in may 1995 and those guys then were in their kind of late 60s early 70s and it's just you know now they're all kind of knocking 100 i mean crikey time is marching on do you do you think that that I mean that technology is absolutely fantastic, and I I hope that that works out and works as well as everyone wants it to. 
Do you think the role of the historian is becoming more important now that we're losing this direct link with people? Because we all grew up with it. We grew up with parents or grandparents talking about the war and giving us their personal experiences. I think we all took it a bit for granted, to be honest. And now I think people are starting to realise that, that, it's, that it's, it's, it's about to reach its end. Do you think the role of the historian, the, the work that you and I do, do you think that becomes more important as we move forward? Yeah, and I think, I think what you'll notice is that there will be a, there will be a shift in perspective as well. Because, uh, and I don't want anyone to take this the wrong way, but quite rightly, we are very, very respectful to veterans and people who've been through stuff. And, you know, I've interviewed all sorts of stuff, including, you know, Aussies who flew, Aussies who fought in, you know, North Africa and stuff. And, you know, you're simply not going to question their memory and you're not going to question what happened to them. But we know for a fact that memory plays tricks, that, you know, someone can absolutely believe age, you know, 78 or 85 or even 92 that something happened. And actually, it might not have happened in quite the way their memory is telling them that it did. And actually, in a strange sort of way, it's going to be kind of liberating as well, because we've got testimonies and diaries and we've recorded lots of people and and so on and actually you can now once they've all gone there will be an ability to stand back a little bit and kind of look at this stuff in the round i mean you know, one of the reasons why we put the germans on the pedestal for example about their kind of tactical brilliance is largely because of the oral testimonies of people who were there and, you know, they sort of go, well, you know, we fought these guys and they never gave up and they were really disciplined. And my God, you know, you never wanted to come across a, you know, a German machine gun and all this kind of stuff. But actually, they're just seeing it from their perspective. And their perspective is that they were having an absolutely horrible time in Normandy, you know, in the hedgerows, in the rain or whatever it might be, or in the dust. And, and they're having this awful time. And what they remember is, you know, that hardened Waffen SS division that w- just wouldn't throw in the towel what they forget about is the kind of absolutely useless um kind of static infantry division that they kind of overran in you know half an hour or something so it, it kind of memory also sort of distorts the reality in a funny sort of way i mean i kind of i'm always really judicious when i when i interview people what i want is i want the funny incidences i want the awful incidences i want I want details about kit. I want to know what it was like wearing battle dress or jungle kit or whatever it might be. You know, I want the details. What I don't want them to do is start telling me about the campaign because, you know, they were 20 at the time and, you know, in the jungle of New Guinea and they knew absolutely diddly squat about what was going on. What they know about is their immediate experience. And that's what I always try and keep them focused on. And that, of course, is absolutely fascinating. But I've noticed that over the years, you know, I'm obviously because the numbers are dwindling, but also because they're getting older. I'm relying in my books and my other work much more on original diaries and letters and stuff than I am on oral testimonies. You do see that a lot in the archives that when you go back and and compare interviews that they did perhaps in the 60s about the, about the second world war compared to now i mean it's understandable they're getting older and we've done i've done a couple of great interviews uh, on this uh, podcast with peter hart the oral historian from the imperial war museum and he is absolutely brilliant and and i'd say to everyone listening if you haven't listened to those podcasts go back and do it because peter's work is absolutely brilliant but he makes that point very clearly that a soldier's war is the six feet in front of him. That's that's what he knows and that's what he understands. And and they and you're right, they often didn't have the context and as and no one would ever take away that the importance of, of speaking to the people who were there and lived through it. And we wouldn't be doing our job of as historians if we ignored that. But I think you are right. I think it's a good point about just context and, and it does free us. Well, up well let me ways. give you a classic example of this. I mean, you know, Jeff, for example, would always say, you know, we were hideously outnumbered in the Battle of Britain. And you sort of go, Well, Yes and no, in actual fact. And I'll give you an example of this. So Battle of Britain Day is the 15th of Sunday, the 15th of September, 1940. There's two big raids. The, big, the raid that everyone talks about was peaks at about 12 o'clock over South East London. And the second one peaks at about three, uh, three o'clock in the afternoon over South East London. And in both uh, the first raid, there were about 75 enemy aircraft, of which only 25 were bombers. So 50 escort. 
and they were attacked variously by about 285 British fighters. In the afternoon one, there were 300, of which only 100 were bombers and 200 were fighter escorts, and they were attacked by about 335 um, single-engine fighter planes. So obviously, they weren't outnumbered at all on that particular engagement. Now, you know, part of the part of the the kind of myth of the Battle of Britain is Churchill going down to the the Uxbridge bunker, talking to Keith Park, the commander of 11th Group in South Southeast England, and turning him to him, going, "Where are all the reserves?" And and you know, Keith Park ominously says, "There are none." You know, but actually, what he means is, I have chosen to use all my all my 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 fighter planes in 11th Group in this particular battle, so that overall we have superiority what he's not saying is there's another 350 you know planes scattered around england that we're not using and so you just need to use it you know and obviously when jeff is one of 12 attacking 300 he's completely outnumbered but as the his, you know as a historian you've got to step back from that and look at it in the in the in the round and look at it in that bigger picture in actual fact we weren't outnumbered. You know, we were overall, we weren't. And the, one of the reasons why you're attacking in a squadron of 12 rather than a mass formation of, you know, 300 or whatever is because you want to disperse your airfields so that they're not all uh, an easy target. They're a smaller target. The more dispersed you are, the harder it is to hit them on the ground. And, and the tactic is to just peck away at this, at this, this formation as it's moving up through the leg of Kent towards England, uh, towards London, and try and knock it off its balance before they get to their main targets, you know, the docks or whatever they are, are in London. So there are reasons for attacking in that formation. But as a 19-year-old Spitfire pilot, you're not going to know any of that. You're just going to think, I'm one of 12. Yikes, there's hundreds of these bastards, and I, <laughs> I'm completely outnumbered. So that's my point, you know, and you just have to kind of, you have to be a bit kind of wary of that stuff. And when you're talking to veterans, you've got to, as a historian, that's why you need to know what you're talking about as well, because you need to know what to ask them and you need to be able to coax out of them the information that you're looking for and not get a lecture on, you know, which is based on a book that they read in 1957. That all makes a lot of sense. And I, I definitely think talking to you about this, we should get you back on to talk about Battle of Britain in the near future, because um, I'm absolutely fascinated to delve into that as well. Um, but we are here to talk about North Africa, um, and I think it's a, from an Australian perspective, it's a really important one. It's one that probably gets somewhat overshadowed by Kokoda uh, in terms of the, if you want to talk about the sexy campaigns, Kokoda probably holds a, a, a stronger place in Australia's collective memory, except for those people who had family members who served during it, and they obviously never forgot about the North Africa campaign. Why don't we start? Can you give us your, your brief, your three-minute overview of just what the hell was going on down there? Because it was, a, it, was a pretty, it was a long campaign. It was complicated. It was big. It involved a lot of different countries. Why were we even down there in the first place? What was happening? Well, okay. So, so, what, so what happens is, is Egypt is a, is a British protectorate, which is a kind of, you know, very much a protectorate, inverted commas, which basically says we can do what we like there. And that's because we control the Suez Canal. But we also have large interests in the Middle East, you know, Palestine and all the rest of it, and Transjordan and stuff, and Iraq, uh, and even Iran. You know, these are all kind of sort of British controlled areas. And that's because Britain, before the war, has the largest empire the world has ever seen, has a, is a, a center or hub of a, the largest global trading empire the world has ever seen as well. And there are kind of extra imperial assets to the British Empire, which are, you know, not strictly speaking the empire, and Egypt and the Suez Canal is, is one. Now, Italy, in the years before the war, has invaded Abyssinia um, and wants to, Mussolini, what he wants to do is have his kind of sphere of influence in the Mediterranean and control of the Mediterranean and North Africa. He, Libya is, a, is, a, is part of um, is Italian, you know, run part of the Italian empire. And he wants to link it all up, you know, take Sudan, take Egypt, uh, take the Suez Canal and all the rest of it. And, and but he knows he's not strong enough to take on Britain. He's only not strong enough to take on France either. But when France falls, then suddenly he's thinking, well, you know, Britain's probably going to sue for peace too. Now's my chance. And he has to, he knows he has to declare war before the French campaign's over, or else he's not going to get the benefit of those assets. So he declares war on the 10th of June, um, you know, just literally just less than two weeks before France capitulates. And, Part of the reason why he has joined the Axis and made an alliance with Nazi Germany is so that 
he's a bit worried that Nazi Germany is going to invade Italy. So he wants to make sure he's, you know, part of their team and part of that gang, but also they're going to have parallel war efforts. So they're going to basically going to be on the same side, but do their own thing. That's, that's his idea. And what he wants to do is invade Greece and invade North Africa. But basically his army's rubbish. It's badly trained. It's badly equipped. It's really out of date. Um, the generals are woeful. Um, the Navy is the most modernized bit, but he's got no radar. He hasn't got much radios. He hasn't got an aircraft carrier. Um, you know, the whole thing is just an absolute shower. And one of the main reasons is, although he's a dictator, he's not a complete, he's not quite the totalitarian dictator that Hitler is. And he's still got to pay lip service to government, to the king. Amazingly, is still a monarchy in Italy. Um, and of course, to the kind of the great, great mob of um, Italian people. So he's he's sort of, treading a kind of narrow line britain's point of view is you know britain was never has a big army it was never going to do the army thing that was france's role and then france gets beaten suddenly britain's thinking oh yikes you know we've got a really massive navy the world's largest we've got a pretty impressive air force we've got an air defense system so that's a big tick what we haven't got is a big army and suddenly we're going to have to kind of expand that and that's where the dominions come in so canada um south africa new zealand and of course australia uh, and india come to help and what there is is the, is the western desert force which is hastily created um with troops that are on their way to britain you know so the australian division is on its way to uh australian troops are on their way to britain that was the original idea to kind of sort of shore things up but then they get you know a, a stopping point is egypt on the way from australia to britain um and, and then italy declares war and so they kind of stay where they are in the in the middle east and um in egypt and so suddenly there was this this western desert force commanded by a british general called dick o'connor it's only like 36,000 men strong, and it's made up of Indians and Aussies, uh, and they go on and take the Italians. <laughs> you know, to cut a long story short, they absolutely smash them. So there's something like 160,000 Italian troops in North Africa. They very tentatively invade Egypt, then stop a few miles in in September 1940. And then... Um, the British, when I say British, I'm talking about Indians and Australians under Dick O'Connor, Western Desert Fort, um, then attack in December, counterattack in December, at Operation Compass, and absolutely smash the smash the um, the Italians. The Italians are so bad, and, and Hitler realizes they need shoring up. Then he's shoring up in Greece as well, where it's all gone terribly wrong as well. Uh, and so he sends down a couple of divisions and a new commander, which is uh, General Rommel, um, to go and shore things up. And Rommel is a kind of sort of complete loose cannon. Uh, and he goes off and counterattacks just at the moment that the Germans are also shoring things up in the Balkans and attacking um, Yugoslavia and Greece. And so we don't have that many troops out there at the time in the Middle East, but we are pledged to, to help the Greeks. So we have to take from North Africa send a whole load of troops, including lots of Australians, over to Greece and to Crete and uh, to help there, and it all goes badly wrong. And it's nothing to do with the Australians at all. The Australians all fight amazingly well. They're incredibly valiant uh, and do an amazing job. Um, but they then have to be evacuated from Greece and from, ultimately from Crete in May 1941. And there are also a whole load of Australian troops are besieged at Tobruk, which is this little port uh, in uh, eastern Libya. And they hold out until December 1941, uh, and uh, or was it November? I can't remember the precise date, but the end of 1941. Um, and uh, then we counterattack again. We built up our troops, so it's now Eighth Army and not just a kind of little corps, um, and um, get pushed back again. And that's the kind of the worst moment, really, the nadir of the British Army in the Second World War is the loss of Tobruk and the collapse of the Gazala Line. And it's again, it's absolutely nothing to do with the troops and everything to do with the generalship which is really not very good at all at that time there's a big clear out in the summer of 1942 the australians help shore up the alamein line which is only 60 miles from from alexandria so they get pushed all the way back from tobruk you know best part of kind of you know 800 miles or something across libya and across uh, most of egypt to the alamein line and the alamein line is interesting because it's literally the only place in the north african desert that can't be outflanked and that's because about 40 42 miles to the south of the coast is the Qatara depression and the Qatara depression is, is unpassable to vehicles so basically you've got a line with a kind of sort of stop point and, and so it's a very strong defensive position and actually although it, it, it's pushed the british all the eighth army all the way back to uh, within 60 miles of alexandria um and is threatening Cairo. 
actually, it's a really, it's really good news because one of the problems with North Africa is there's nothing there. It's a desert, and the distances are absolutely vast. So the side that's got the shorter supply lines is always going to have a massive advantage, and that's basically what happened. So suddenly, you know, as the Axis forces combined German-Italian armies commanded by Rommel is moving into Egypt, so its own supply lines are getting stretched and stretched and stretched while our lines are getting shorter, which means that it's easier to resupply. And there we hold, Montgomery comes in, General Alexander comes in as Commander-in-Chief of the Middle East. He's really good news, bit forgotten in the shadow of Monty, but actually it's his show rather than Monty's in many ways. And then they counterattack, first um, holding off Rommel's uh, big thrust at Alam Halfa at the very end of August 1942. And then there is the big thrust at the, 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 the 8th Army launch under General Montgomery uh, on the 23rd of October 1942. And that is the Second Battle of Alamein. It's the Battle of Alamein that we all know. It's largely successful. Um, and uh, a key part of that are the Australian division that um, um, that has the north of the line. And they, they fight absolutely, you know, phenomenally well. I mean, you know, Aussies are just really tough people that kind of just keep going uh, and we absolutely maul the uh, panzer army africa send them all the way back into libya all the way back into tunisia at which point the, the australians have withdrawn and sent back to um sent back to australia so that's a bit more than three minutes but um you know a kind of crash course in what's going on so from the point of view of the british egypt and north africa it starts off as being a, a theater of opportunity it's 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 they never intend to be there they never intend to kind of really fight a big battle but when Ita italy kind of you know declares war there is an opportunity there to strike back knock the axis partner have a have a have a go at the germans you know upset the kind of you know hitler's plans and all the rest of it all of which is incredibly successful and although there are some checks along the way and there's some things that don't go 100 percent according to plan you know greece and crete for example tobruk and gazala overall it's an incredibly successful campaign which does exactly what we wanted to do which is ultimately lead to knocking italy out of the war and drawing on vast amounts of resources from the germans which they can ill afford to kind of put into that theater james well thank you for that summary i mean that was fantastic um you should do this for a living um <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the North, tell me about the North Africa campaign and its importance in the grand scheme of things. Because the reason I say this is, it, it, there's some similarities there almost with Gallipoli in the First World War. That it, you know, it's the same sort of area. This this sort of harsh terrain. It was a, a, a front that we didn't intend to be fighting on, but necessity of this uh, sort of second tier ally of the enemy came on board, and then we had to deal with them as well. But you know, my understanding of North Africa is it was not a Gallipoli at all, that it was actually a very important contribution to the war, and it was very important in the grand scheme of things. Just give me your perspective on that. What role did North Africa play in the grand scheme of the Second World War? In, in terms of grand strategy, I don't think it was quite as... Um, it's, it's not as important as other theatres. It becomes important because of the Italians. It becomes important because it is the testing ground for the British Army. You know, the whole point is that Britain doesn't do big armies. We never have tradition. We've never gone into war. There's, there's literally like two times in British history where we've gone into war on our own. You know, we like having coalition partners. Um, and the whole strategy for World War II of taking on Nazi Germany in 1939 was that France would do the army bit and we'd do the flying and, and particularly the naval bit and economic blockade, and we'd provide lots of supplies because of our vast merchant navy and global reach. You know, that's, that's how it was going to work. When France goes out, suddenly everyone thinks, oh, yikes, you know, we haven't got a big army, and we're going to have to kind of expand it. And what, what North Africa enables us to do is expand and work out kind of how to operate our forces in a coalition way because although it's you know we like to call it in broad brushes british of course it's not it's 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 british and australian and new zealand and indian and you know gurkha <laughs> and all those different things and actually that's quite a complex operation with different requirements and different needs and different styles and different cultures you know you might have the same monarch but actually you're all quite different people and so that has to be worked out and we have to work out what we need you know what weapons do we need you know suddenly the two pounder anti-tank gun isn't any good because the distances in north africa are not like northern europe where it's all fields and hedgerows and 
cozy little lanes it's suddenly big open countryside and you know you've got to learn those lessons and you've got to work out how to have a how do you how do you develop a tactical air force because we haven't had that we have strategic air forces we have air forces that operate on their own that's what the RAF does as bomber commanders fighter commanders coastal command they don't work in cahoots with ground forces and when we did try it in north and france in 1940 it didn't really work so all that needs to be worked out as well and actually what saves eighth army bacon in the summer of 1942, is the development of close air support with the Desert Air Force and the RAF. And, you know, these are new tactics, new doctrine that has been worked out painstakingly over in North Africa, all of which is then applied to the campaign in Italy that follows in Sicily, the campaign in Northwest Europe as well. You know, a lot of the, how we use air power in the, over the beaches of Normandy, for example, are worked out with blood and sweat and flies in the heat of North Africa. So North Africa is more important than it than strategic at the beginning of the war it is. I mean, there is this idea, you know, oh my God, you know, if the oil fields of the Middle East had gone, you know, we'd be in the doo-doo. Well, actually, no, we wouldn't, because the oil fields of the Middle East only supply the Middle East. So if you don't have the Middle East, you don't really need the oil fields. And actually, there's no real way that the Germans are going to get to those oil fields or use them, A, because they're not massively productive in that, that, that period in the war. And B, the Germans don't have the capacity to get that oil from where, where it is in you know, the deserts of Iraq and, and Iran back to Germany. I mean, you know, there's no oil pipelines and stuff. They don't have any shipping. The Germans have almost no shipping, nor do the Italians, certainly by 1942. So, you know, it's kind of... It, it, it's 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 important because it becomes important. It's not important so much at the beginning of the war. But having been drawn into this battle against the Italians and then drawing in the Germans, which incidentally is potentially decisive because of what happens in Russia in the summer of 1941. You know, can, can you think of anything more stupid um, if you're Hitler and the Germans? You've got the biggest battle of arms the world has ever seen which is when nazi germany invades the soviet union in june 1941 and yet a month before you use your best trained infantry troops you know the the Fallschirmjäger, the paratroopers with your most precious aircraft your transport aircraft in an operation on crete which frankly is neither here nor there in the big strategic picture and is going to give you very little gain why would you do that and actually, the consequence of Crete is that half their best trained troops are killed or lost or made prisoner, and they lose 250 of their precious cargo planes, which they can ill afford and which, by jingo, they're going to need in the steps of the Soviet Union, uh, and suddenly they don't have. And so what, what, the, what the Mediterranean theatre does is just suck dry precious resources that Nazi Germany simply cannot afford when it needs to be focused on, on one major operation at a time. Nazi Germany cannot afford to fight a war on multiple fronts, and that's what happens as a result of the North Africa campaign, of British and indeed Australian intervention in Greece, in Crete, and all the rest of it. So although ultimately Greece ends in defeat, and so does Crete, actually the damage it inflicts on the Nazi war aims is far greater than the significance of the loss as a result of that campaign. It's the aspect, the aspect of the Second World War that I always find fascinating is nothing happens in isolation. Everything has a knock-on effect. And during my research for this podcast, I came across this incredible statistic that at the height of Stalingrad, when the Germans, when the, when the army was surrounded, the Germans were surrounded outside Stalingrad and fighting for their very existence and for, you know, to ensure that the entire Russian campaign didn't completely fall over, fully half of the transport planes that they needed to resupply that army in Stalingrad were diverted to North Africa to help support the uh, the Africa Corps as well. Yeah, which is which is you know, and what is really really interesting if you if you again one takes a step back, what you see is is that the Western Allies on the whole make the right decisions. They prioritise in the right way. That that their their resources are well prioritised. Where they focus is well prioritised. Then look at the Germans, and constantly they're just making really bad decisions. And, and I think too often in the narrative of World War II, we're too dazzled by, you know, the victory at, in Crete and the kind of capture of Malem airfield or whatever it might be, rather than looking back from it a little bit and kind of deconstructing actually what's going on and actually saying, well, you know, actually it's a pretty 
pyrrhic victory, really. I mean, Germany, although although Nazi Germany takes Crete, they definitely come off worse for the campaign than than Britain does. James, when we talk about when we talk about North Africa, we often, from at least from an Australian perspective, there's often this feeling that it was a very noble campaign. I think this came from the, the, the troops that fought there and then perhaps went on to fight the Japanese in New Guinea and in the Pacific. And the Japanese were such a ferocious, unforgiving enemy and such a cruel enemy. I think in the later years after the war, there was a perception that the Germans were the noble enemy, you know, that we fought against the Germans and they were tough fighters and we had some hard times in the desert. But, you know, you, it was, a, it was, a, it was a, a, a noble fight, you know, it was a man's fight. It was man to man, and there was no there was no atrocities. And do you think that that's right? Yeah, that's been coloured by later fights. You know, there were a few there were a few Bedouins and stuff, but, and the, you know, and a few North Africans and stuff. But by and large, there weren't that many civilians. You know, so it was seen as a sort of fairly clean war. You know, and and Rommel has a lot to a lot to uh, um, play in that part because you know he he was very much sort of considered himself a sort of noble knight, even though he was often enthralled to Hitler. Um, you know, he he did he he did sort of consider himself a sort of gentleman soldier, uh, and honourable and decent and all that kind of stuff. So he he sort of set that tone, and I think that I think that was the case. And you know, it's amazing how many uh, sort of Eighth Army and Africa Corps veterans sort of got to know one another and got on after the war. You know, and kind of um, you know war without hate and all that kind of stuff. So I think there was quite a lot of that going on. And don't forget, also there was no Waffen SS divisions in North Africa, which makes a big difference because you know Waffen SS. You know they are more fanatical, and I don't know. I you know I've interviewed a, n- a number of German veterans as well of the North Africa campaign, and you know I think that really does come across. So yeah, I think there is a lot of that. And I, as you as you you point out, you know compared to the Japanese, you know they're kind of it's a it's a it's a different world in North Africa. You know, and I think also there is a kind of sort of I think both sides kind of understood that the conditions were incredibly tough. You know, all those flies, the heat, the dryness. You know. It, it, the, the the abrasiveness of the sand, the sort of camzine, the kind of uh, the winds, the sandstorms that used to sweep in, you know, really sort of debilitating. It's a very tough, brutal place in which to live, in which to 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 live and fight and operate. And so, I think most both sides kind of understood that there were kind of two wars going on. There was the there was a war against one another of the actual sort of fighting, and there was the war of just kind of existing in that incredibly tough environment. And, and that actually both sides kind of drew a sort of level of respect for one another as a result of that shared experience, which no one else was sharing anywhere else in the world. So I think, I think that, that is true. Well, just before we wrap it up, I wanted to focus just on something else to do with the Australian involvement um, in North Africa. That for us, I mean, I think the perspective is different in Britain, but for us, the, the, the real iconic moment was Tobruk, the siege of Tobruk. Um, Alamein's important obviously, but uh, Tobruk is seen as this absolutely incredible moment. And I think I understand why, you know, backs to the wall. Again, the Gallipoli legend was reenacted uh, by the next generation at Tobruk. Give us your perspective, though, because I know it's different in Britain. I know Alamein is seen for the absolutely decisive. No, I think Tobruk is really important. I think, And I think it's just so traumatic that it gets lost in June 1942 when it needn't done. So the the big thing about Tobruk is is the, the it was it was unbelievably how... Uh, well, it showed two things. First of all, it showed how tough the Aussies were and all the other guys who were there. I mean, you know, bloody hard kind of being stuck in Tobruk all that time. I mean, don't forget, they were being kind of resupplied by the sea, which was the the, the boon of the whole thing. You know, that's what made it possible. What was so awful and what, what was so abject about the fall of Tobruk in June 1942 is that the most sensible thing would have to have been done away with the Gazala line, which is about you know, 15 miles further west from Tobruk itself, and actually just reinforced Tobruk. So you don't bother with a line. What you do is you you create your own lines of sort of Torres Vedras around Tobruk, absolutely drench it in mines, and just make it completely impregnable. Now, Rommel can bypass Tobruk if he wants and go into Egypt, but he can't bypass it for very long. He's got to turn and face and deal with it. Because otherwise, Tobruk is going to spring out and cut his forces in two. Because his supply lines are going to be incredibly long. And there's no way he can get into Egypt and protract a major campaign while Tobruk is strongly held. But the idiots that are running 8th Army at the time don't do that. They create a separate line, separate on a way from Tobruk. And that just makes no military sense whatsoever. 
And so what happens is Rommel goes down the bottom of the Gazala line, turns around behind the back of it, envelops it, everyone collapses. And the Tobruk garrison, which is very small by this point because everyone's in the Gazala line, then has to fall back in disarray. And so it's lost. And it's so shameful because, of course, the Aussies and the others who are defending Tobruk for much of 1941 do so so brilliantly and show how, how one can defend a place like that. So for it to suddenly collapse in June 1942 is really bad. So I think, I think the Australians are rightly proud of, of Tobruk, but you should also be rightly proud of what they do at Alamein, which is really, really phenomenal. I mean, it's, it's, it, that, that is just brutal infantry operations in incredibly tough conditions, and they just keep going. And they're the ones that kind of push further than anyone else um, in the, you know, on the main northern thrust. So I think you should feel really proud of both parts, really. And I think you should feel disgruntled. I think, I think Aussies have got right to feel disgruntled about what happened at Brook in the summer of 1942. Great point. So it's such a great story to Brook. And I'm actually at the moment um, speaking to a couple of, there are a couple of surviving rat, rats of Tobruk in, here in Sydney. Wow. And I'm, I'm hoping to get them on the show. And they're, they're, I think there's about four of them and they're all over 100, but they still, you know, they still have their wits about them. And so I'm, I'm hoping that I will be able to bring people in the coming, uh, the coming months interviews with those original rats that survive because we really have to speak to them this is absolutely our last chance to speak to them um, before they're all gone um james it's just been fantastic thank you so much i mean what, what are you working on now what's the what's the next project that we're going to see from james holland uh well i'm just wrapping up on a on a normandy um book a big new narrative history of the normandy campaign so that's 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 kept me pretty busy uh, i'm trying to get a, a a movie off the ground at the moment about a novel based on a novel i did you know many years ago called a pair of silver wings um and then you know kind of a host of other stuff as well so it's all you know it's exciting times Matt. to be honest that's wonderful well, thank you so much for joining us we will definitely get you back on the show again because i your insight into the second world war and your interesting perspectives at looking at these things in a different way i think are really important for us to uh, to to focus on so mate it's been fantastic thanks so much for being on the show no, thank you. Thanks for having me and talk to you again soon, Matt.